Hey guys, we're diving into the prophecy of a guy named Micah. Biblical prophecy is actually, in my opinion, kind of a really hard genre to deal with. It's planted in a certain time in the past, talking about events that happened between now and then and events that might happen in the future. So there's a lot of context that we have to wade through and we don't want to miss the message that the reason the prophet is speaking is something to address at that time and place when he's looking for a response to turn people back to God, restore their covenant faithfulness, and for them to be refreshed in this beautiful, corrective vision of God's love amid their own brokenness and failure. This is just a prelude, a look at the first verse of Micah, and it answers a lot of questions. Who, when, where, and what? So let's drop a beat and dive in. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth. Who is this guy? Micah has related no account of his call to be a prophet, only experiences of carrying out his awesome work. Thank you, C. Hassel Bullock. Some of these books, we've got kind of some biographical information. Let's continue his work here. Amos satisfies our curiosity by telling us what his occupation was. Hosea relates an intriguing story about his life that includes his prophetic call. But Micah feeds neither our curiosity nor anesthetizes it with an emotional drama. So who is this guy? Well, let's take apart what we do know of Moresheth. Coming from the small town of Moresheth in the Shephelah, it seems logical that he might have been a small farmer or craftsman, but we have no way of knowing that. Do you hear that, guys? We don't know exactly who this guy is that's spitting bars, calling out people in Jerusalem and Samaria, as we'll get to in a second. What do we know about his hometown, then? Maybe that could help. Micah's hometown is situated about 1,000 feet above sea level, overlooking the coastal highway in the plain, over which countless armies and commercial caravans had traversed the distance between Egypt and Mesopotamia. So this is a guy who sits above the road here watching the drama of the globe unfold. He feels this burden to go and to speak on behalf of the Lord. And what we have here in this in this book is a collection of his prophecy. As we will deal with as we go throughout this study, it's not just a genre that talks about the future. I think we get that in our head. It's a genre that actually deals with a historical relationship between God and the people. And he is calling this people, his people, back into covenant faithfulness. What he sees from his vantage point is really disconcerting, a really challenging diagnosis of the way things are among the people of God. But when is this happening? This is a key question because this helps us understand the, the cultural context, the political uh, and, and, and geo, geopolitical issues that they are, they're wrestling with. Were the people of Israel in a, in a really robust and healthy place with God as they have been in periods in history or were they in a state of spiritual decay? Well, we get this in verse one. During the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. One of the best things you can do when you're entering a prophet, if they give you the, the list of kings that their, their tenure uh, was under, we can dive into the, the books of the kings and the chronicles to kind of take a look at, at historically what the spiritual temperature of Israel was. So if you look at this timeline, let's look a little closer, pulled this from a website called Live Holy, and he's overlapping, Micah is, with a couple of prophets that you're familiar with. Jonah and Amos came prior to Micah, but Micah is prophesying contemporaneously with Isaiah and with Hosea. One of the, the fun things to do is to take a, a block of the prophets that are all prophesying around the same time period under the same kings and take a look at their incisive view about what's happening in the state of Israel. So if you want to poke around further there, take a look at other prophets during the same time period and we can get a kind of a comprehensive layered approach to understanding what were the issues in this day that Micah comes to address and how does he add to the harmony of the other prophets and their diagnosis of Israel's spiritual state. To kind of ground us with some like historical context, we, we look at Chisholm, his work here, Jerusalem and the Davidic dynasty would undergo humiliation in the immediate future and the Lord would take away the people's sources of false security. So we're at a, a time where we're dealing with this false sense of security that Israel has, even though it's covenantally unfaithful, it still believes that God's going to keep them from humiliation. But what we find as we press fast forward on, on the future of Israel is that God actually uses humiliation for their redemption. Message. <laughs> 
<laughs> God actually uses humiliation for their redemption. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. And where, where is this dude? We talked about his hometown, but where is he focused? What is his prophecy addressing? Micah is considered a Southern Kingdom prophet because he's predominantly speaking out against the Southern Kingdom uh, with the, the capital there in Jerusalem. But let's get this from verse one, the vision he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So if you don't know anything about Samaria, Samaria is actually the capital of the Northern Kingdom. Thanks for the map, Wikipedia. If you remember, uh, the, the kingdom of Israel was united under Saul and then David, kind of a high watermark, and then uh, under Solomon. And then after only three kings of a united monarchy, uh, the kingdom split into two kingdoms, the northern uh, ten tribes and the southern two, Judah and Benjamin, shorthand named the kingdom of Judah, also known as the southern kingdom, uh, centered in the capital city of Jerusalem, and the north that was immediately plunged into idolatry at the bequest of Jeroboam the first, making two calf idols independent of the temple worship in the south. So we wrestled with that northern kingdom's issues and its history as we covered Jonah. You can find Jonah, Jonah, SMH on our playlist as we covered Amos. And right next to it is Woke Amos. We explored those a couple years ago. So if you want to check out that period of time and the spiritual issues there, but just past those prophet's times as Samaria is about to fall, as the false sense of security starts to shake off, we find our prophet Micah addressing what he saw concerning Samaria, but aiming his voice at Jerusalem, at the Southern Kingdom. A cautionary tale is unfolding up north. Will the people hear? What is it that is his message? Okay, maybe we got our, our ground a little bit on what's going on, the who, the when, the where, but what? What is this about? What, what is Micah's beef? Why is he spitting bars? What's really going on there that needs to be addressed that God's saying to his people then and is through this context and through the, the text that's been preserved and through this bar-spitting prophet? What is he saying to us? Uh, going from Arnold and Bayer, Micah's message centered on themes of social injustice, true worship, and false security. So these are the things we're going to find challenged in this book. Is there injustice around us? It's a concern of God's. Are our hearts truly turn toward God and worship, or are we surrounded by idols of our age? This is a concern of God. Do we have a false sense of security in our context? That's a concern of God's. Carol Kaminsky wrote this fantastic overview of the whole Old Testament, New Testament narratives. And from her book on the Old Testament, we get this really helpful summary of the book of Micah and his message. You can also remember an important theme in Micah through the following mnemonic. Micah, miscarriage of justice. So that's what we're going to be focused on. And all of these contexts, we're going to explore, we're going to flesh this out, we're going to get a, a good picture, a good diagnosis, a good read of what's going on. Because the more we like engage the world, the Bible, the better we are at engaging our own world. I believe that. So as we acquaint ourselves with the particulars of Micah's day and the challenges, and we understand the nuances of his message at that time, we start to hear his message spill into our own world and are able to see ourselves and God more clearly. And this is the concern of God. Miscarriage of justice does not go unnoticed by God. If it happens, nay, when it happens, God sees it and he comes to call it out and he comes to inspire his people to be about the work of justice, of righteousness, of shalom, of making the world right through him. As God, through the prophetic voice, is making things right. We need to understand that things are not right where we are, in our context, in our day. So what are the injustices of our day, of our place? Would you go with God with that question, journal, write, discuss, and may we tune our hearts to the world around us as we attempt to let the words of Micah speak to our situations and as we seek to hear God and discern what is right, what is good, and how are we to walk with God today. Let's read Micah with open eyes and open hearts and let's go to God to hear him together. Thank you for joining us in Spitting Bars as we attempt to engage the prophetic voice as we attempt to understand how and why God has his church about the business of justice. 
Godspeed, and we'll see you next time.